Hey everyone, this is Insane of the Rain Music. The title of this video is I'm done being a content creator. I'm not going to be uploading new covers anymore on this channel, and instead I'm choosing to pursue things that are better for my future and better for video game music as a whole. I know this news might be upsetting for some of you. Um, it is for me too a little bit. But I'd like to ask you to listen to my story and listen to how I came to this decision. I've included timestamps in the description that have um, different parts of my explanation, but I'd encourage you not to skip ahead in the video and watch the whole thing because the explanation is, in my opinion, pretty thorough and pretty important. So I started this channel in September of 2012, just on a whim, um, doing covers of music that I loved. I started off doing piano covers and eventually added in, added in saxophone and then somehow stumbled into the world of doing jazz arrangements. That wasn't even the idea when I first started out. I was just, you know, a 14-year-old kid with a Canon PowerShot camera who decided to record himself playing some piano covers of video game music. I'm so fortunate to have been able to grow this channel to what it is now and to be able to do this as my job, but this has always been about me pursuing my passion for video game music. And for me to keep doing that, at a higher and higher level, I need to make some changes. By the way, I've got a script above the camera, so if my eyes go up there, I'm looking at the script because this is a pretty lengthy video. So why have I decided to stop being a content creator? I have a few reasons for this, but let's define, I'll, I'll, at least I'll share my definition of what a content creator is at first. For me, a content creator is someone who makes some kind of media for a public audience in any specific context. It's kind of a broad definition, but you know, you can kind of feel when someone's a content creator versus when they're not. I love being a musician. I've loved music ever since I was a kid. I've also loved video games ever since I was a kid. And these are things that I don't do for anybody else. These are things that I do because I love them. They are part of who I am. And I can't say the same about content creation necessarily. Content creation for me has been a means to an end to share that love with other people. But for me to keep doing it and sharing it with people at a higher level and a higher standard of quality that I want to hold myself to, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. So my first main reason for wanting to stop comes down to being a social media personality and what that means as opposed to, you know, just being a musician. Um, I'm a musician that's primarily been raised on YouTube and I've learned a lot of things from it. Um, if you watch any sort of how to grow your YouTube channel kind of video, you know, they encourage you to niche down and pick one particular thing that you're good at and just do that over and over again, because then you sort of build your own audience and train your audience to expect this one specific thing from you. I sort of stumbled into the niche of making video game jazz covers, even though it wasn't necessarily exactly what I wanted to do when I started out. You know, I love jazz music and I love video games, so it's pretty natural that those things go together. And following YouTube advice, I basically tried to claim that niche for myself. Now, let me tell you that I'm not the only one who does this. I'm certainly not the only one. There are plenty of other channels, um, such as The Consoles, Eric L, Charles Ritz, Luminous Music, The 8-Bit Big Band, and a whole bunch of other people that do jazz or jazz-influenced versions of video game music. And you know, if you're, if you're disappointed that I'm not going to be uploading, you should check them out. They have some good stuff as well. The problem with this niching down thing is that I'm not just a jazz musician. Yeah, I like jazz, but it's not the only thing I like, you know. Many of the videos that I've uploaded with the words jazz cover in the title aren't really jazz in the most traditional sense. Um, for example, the Pollyanna video, which I did with Family Jewels, Atrosaurus, and Sab Irene, I felt so pressured and sort of just became a habit to put jazz in the title because people expect me to be, oh, in Santa of the Rain's the jazz video game cover guy. You can do that. He, he, he does that thing. And, you know, if you really ask me, that song is not even jazz at all. Sure, sure, it has some influences of jazz harmony and things like that, but it's really more of like a, you know, like a, like a funk or soul kind of thing. Now, some of the videos with the jazz in the title might be influenced historically by jazz or performed by a musician like myself that has been raised in the jazz tradition. But in the end, the name of the genre is a marketing term. Most artists that I've spoken to prefer not to define themselves in such a narrow niche like jazz. You know, they prefer to explore music, explore music for what all of it is and expand their horizons and just consume all the music that there is or consume all the Art, all the human experience that there is to live. You know, why should we just restrict ourselves to one lane? Now, I'm the kind of person that likes to do just a few things 
but focus on each of those things extremely intensely and do them to the best of my ability. And if I were to focus on YouTube intensely and do it to the best of my ability and achieve the metrics that the platform requests or wants from me, it will be at odds with who I know I really am as a musician and as a person. I don't want to niche down like this forever. I have other things I want to do. Being a YouTuber isn't just about being a good musician. You've also got to be an entertainer. You know, flashy titles, thumbnails, exaggerated movement and expressions. You know, like when I put on my sunglasses and I ring the ring the triangle to imitate Spamton, you know, things like that. They're, they're fun to do sometimes, but their, their purpose is to capture the attention of the audience. You know, it doesn't necessarily make the creation itself, the quality of the music itself, that much better. Now, you could argue that, well, what is the quality of a creation if there's no audience to listen to it? And perhaps that's a philosophical discussion that you could have, but not one that I'm going to have in this video. For me, if you look around, I'm not sure how much you can see in the background of this video, but, you know, I have a lot of instruments here. And honestly, learning a lot of instruments has kind of become one of my gimmicks. Now, I genuinely do love learning new instruments. I love learning them so I can understand the perspectives of other musicians that I work with, so that I can better understand the music I listen to. And I just have a fun time, you know, learning the mechanics of something like the trumpet coming from the perspective of a saxophone player. But doing it in a public way on YouTube has turned it into a kind of a spectacle. And... It shouldn't be a spectacle. I've never intentionally tried to make this point, but I think some people have unfortunately taken this point um, from my videos that the number of instruments you play indicates how good a musician you are, which is absolute, you know, that's garbage. That's not true. Instruments are just a tool to express your musical idea or your, or your emotion, just like language, you know. If you have the ability to play a certain instrument, it may mean that you can express yourself in a certain way, but it's just a tool. It's not something to compare yourself to other people with. You know, I have the same feeling about music competitions that they're useful because as human beings, we like to see things ranked. You know, we like our top 10 lists. We like to know what is defin definitively the best air conditioner of 2021, right? But when it comes to art, that kind of hierarchy doesn't really work. And I think we try to make it that way sometimes. From my point of view, every channel on YouTube, and maybe not just YouTube I'm talking about here, but all social media sites exist on a spectrum between you know, catering to what their audience wants and doing things for themselves. And most people are somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And there are creators that I have respected and idolized for a long time. Um, I started using YouTube when I was in maybe at the very end of elementary school or middle school for me. And um, some creators like Chucka Conroy, Ethos Lab, Stephen George, Poop Poop Fart, I think he's PPF now on YouTube, all of them, in my opinion, have done such a great job of staying true to themselves and not, you know, bending their content so much to what the audience wants. And that's why they've been able to do it for so long. That's why they've been able to, you know, keep this channel going because the reward they get out of that is something intrinsic. They haven't fallen as much into the trap of relying on viewers or relying on what YouTube tells them is a good thing to get validation. They know that the content they make is great. And they keep doing it because they have that belief. And I admire them for that. And that's something I've tried to work on for myself. So thanks to those channels for being an inspiration for me. At the end of the day, though, entertaining isn't necessarily what brings me the most fulfillment. I know some of my friends who do content creation do it because they love, you know, seeing the smile on someone's face or hearing that they've made someone else's day better. And, you know, that is a great feeling. And I think that's an amazing reason to do what you do. But for me, that's not necessarily the essential purpose. For me, it's always been about the music. It's about being emotionally moved by a piece of music. It's about, it's about letting this particularly unique art form affect you in a way that very other few things on this earth can. And that's why I love music so much. It, it tells a story. And as human beings, we love stories. So music just lights up. At least for me, it lights up. It feels like every part of my brain. And I just couldn't live without it. Unfortunately, that feeling of being blown away or emotionally moved by a piece of music isn't necessarily what this platform or other social media platforms reward. I won't say that they completely disregard it because, you know, there's some bar of quality that you need. But at a certain point, the spectacle of the video is more important than the content itself. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, we're all humans. We're all attracted to shiny objects and large amounts of money and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not interested in pursuing spectacles. I'm interested in making great music 
and telling great stories and sharing my love for video games and music. For so many years, I trudged along uploading on YouTube, knowing full well that my values didn't really align with the platform. But, you know, during the period of COVID especially, I think it's been a very introspective time for many of us and we've been asking ourselves what our purpose is and what we really want to do with our time, knowing how precious and limited it is. And I've decided I'm not, I don't want to play that game anymore. This isn't a balance that I want to strike anymore. I don't want to have to form myself to the expectations of YouTube or any other social media platform necessarily. Another reason why I'm choosing not to continue posting covers is legal reasons. <laughs> I've spent quite a bit of time doing research on the legal aspects of covering video game music, and I've seen a lot of misinformation about this spread online. So I'd like to briefly clear up some of this misinformation and explain why there are perhaps some reasons to be concerned about doing this, legally speaking. Now, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I have spoken to one, but none of this is legitimate legal advice or anything. This is just my understanding of the law as it pertains to the United States of America, um, as it pertains to video game music covers on YouTube. I'm not currently facing any legal action or anything, but it's just something I've been thinking about for the past couple of years. Now, when you upload a video to YouTube or any other social media platform, you are publishing a creation that you've made to the world. And if you are using any content that you don't own entirely, you would need the proper permission to distribute such materials. In my case, since I'm mostly uploading covers of um, music composed by other people, you need specific licenses like an arrangement license just to give you the permission to arrange the music, um, a print license for distributing the sheet music of your arrangement, and a synchronization license for giving you the right to synchronize your piece of music with a video that gets uploaded on YouTube. I don't have these licenses <laughs> for pretty much any of my songs with a very, very, very few exceptions. So does that mean basically all the videos are illegal? Well, yes, <laughs> this is true. Um, so if they're all illegal, then why has no major legal action been taken yet? It comes down to a problem of enforcement. Now, the original copyright holders do have the legal right to protect their copyrights. And on YouTube, this would probably come in the form of some DMCA takedown or content ID claim or match. Um, yet, I've rarely received any of those on my videos. In fact, there are probably less than 10 covers out of the 400 that I've, 400 at least, that I've made on the site that have been claimed. And that's a problem. A lot of people complain about claims, but in reality, they're supposed to be good things. They're supposed to be a way for the original rights holder to enforce their policy. In an ideal world, you know, if I covered, let's say, let's say a Sonic song, I would probably, I would like to get some sort of content ID claim from Sega or whoever the proper rights holder is of that song that says, okay, we're acknowledging that you're doing a cover of the song. Here is our policy regarding where it can be viewed in the world and what the monetization is. I would much prefer that over having this enormous gray area of, you know, not knowing what the right policy is. Or perhaps there is a policy that's written on some website somewhere, but because it's not enforced on your specific video by some sort of system, you don't really know if you're in the right or the wrong. I know this process is complicated for video game music specifically because of how video game music appears in different contexts, like in the context of, you know, someone just ripping the music and uploading it to YouTube versus hearing it in the background of a Let's Play. In my opinion, and in most people's opinion, those are very different uses, one of which is transformative and one of which is pretty much not transformative. Because of this problem with enforcement and choosing not to enact the rights that these people technically have to enforce policies on their music or their creations, internet culture has evolved in a way that these things that are technically illegal have just become the norm. Like, for example, when a new game comes out and you want to hear the soundtrack, the first place you probably go is somebody who's uploaded the soundtrack on YouTube, right? YouTube has basically become the de facto place where all your favorite video game soundtracks get uploaded. And it's usually not by the official source. It's usually by somebody who either records their game or rips the files and makes a bunch of videos and puts them on YouTube. Now, some of these soundtracks are properly content ID matched, which is what you would want. And in fact, some companies like Nintendo have been enforcing their content ID policies in taking down some of these uploads, which they are in full legal right to do. Um, but the majority of these uploads on YouTube are just bootlegs. They're ripped from the game by somebody random, and the original composers or original copyright holders aren't getting any sort of payment or receiving any of the benefits that they could get from having that music out there on the internet. Now, this is where some of you might be thinking of, oh, well, that's just fair use, right? And your videos are probably protected by fair use, right? And perhaps, you know, 
But fair use is a legal defense. You know, you have to actually go into court to be able to claim fair use. And the problem with that is going to court costs an exorbitant amount of money. And it's a bunch of headaches that I've really, <laughs> really, in fact, I don't think anybody really wants to deal with that. Um, so fair use is also up to the interpretation of the judge and the jury and whoever else has an influence on that. And it's just enormously complicated. This situation of, you know, uploading music to YouTube, even assuming that video game property is communal property, like you don't think twice about using that image of Mario in your video essay thumbnail. But technically, you know, that image is owned by somebody and that's a copyrighted image. Technically, you need permission to use that, don't you? But we just do it anyway. It's become so much of our natural internet culture, natural internet remix culture, to take these things that have been, you know, made by some company and our copyrighted material that was made for profit. And we just, you know, use it ourselves and, and transform it in some sort of way. For the first few years of me making video game music covers, I had no idea about any of these copyright rules. And most people who start out making video game, video game covers don't know any of the rules either. All I wanted to do was just play my favorite video game music on instruments. And I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Now, apart from YouTube, my downloads on places like Spotify and iTunes are licensed using what's called a compulsory mechanical license, meaning the original rights holder gets paid a royalty every time that specific song is streamed or downloaded. To get a compulsory mechanical license, a piece of music that you want to cover or arrange needs to be commercially released in, um, in, my, in my case, in most of our cases, the United States. Um, I do most of my distribution through a company called Sounddrop, and they are a U.S.-based company, so they have to abide by U.S. copyright law. So, for example, if I want to distribute a cover of a Pokemon song or something, I would have to make sure that the cover is available commercially in the U.S., which most of it is because Pokemon Super Music collections are available on iTunes, and that's how I can distribute my songs on Spotify and iTunes and be in the legal right to do that. However, that's not exactly the same thing as going to the publisher and asking them directly. You know, you're not really getting express permission, you're just being told that they can't say no. Some publishers and composers are actually extremely receptive of their music getting covered. And I've had the fortune of meeting some of these composers through these covers that I've made, and it's that's been a really cool experience. Um, but some of them are not as receptive. And in fact, there have been there has been history of some publishers taking down covers of their music that have that have been um, sold commercially on certain platforms for whatever reason. And again, they have the completely legal right to do that. It's just they don't often exercise that right. For me, it's grown to be a problem because this thing that I started doing for fun, you know, uploading video game music covers has grown into my job. It's grown into something bigger, frankly, bigger than I really want to handle. You know, this is a lot of work for one person. And yeah, I could bring on more people to help. But but for me, I, I don't want to turn this into a company. This has just been about it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a passion project. I never had any intention when I started out of, you know, making this my job or intentionally profiting off of other people's creations. It just kind of grew that way. It just kind of grew organically into it. Now, it's very possible there might come a time when, you know, some or all of my material gets taken down. Because there are people, there are original rights holders that do have the right to do that. And that's a risk I've just lived with for the past few years of, or how many years I've been uploading. And, you know, it's not really one I want to continue living with. You know, I want to be able to build a career, build a lifestyle for myself that doesn't have to worry about, you know, somebody coming in content ID claiming or, cop or DMCA striking some cover or some of my videos. And that's why I want to shift to a lot more original stuff because I love doing it and it's something I own entirely. I'd like to also share my perspective on how video game music has evolved and is seen by the internet as a whole. Um, it reminds me a lot of The Great American Songbook, which is a collection of songs written for Broadway, Hollywood, and Tin Pan Alley back in between the um, 1920s and 1950s in the U.S. For an entire generation of people, these songs are their songs, you know, and they have expanded far beyond their original source material. For example, the tune All the Things You Are was written for a Broadway musical that apparently flopped, but many years later, you know, it's one of the most popular jazz standards out there. It really has nothing to do with the original musical. It's just become the song that you call at a jam session, and it's effectively become community property among jazz musicians. And I think you could say the same thing, or at least a similar thing about songs like 
Bob on Battlefield, Dire Dire Docks, Lost Woods, Green Hill Zone. These have become the standards of at least my generation of people that are interested in into video game music. We grew up with these songs. These songs have been ingrained into our heads during our childhood because of the media we consumed. And when we play them at places like MAGFest or video game music jam sessions, they, if they just like jazz standards, they extend so far beyond their original purpose. You know, Dire Dire Docks becomes less about Mario swimming in Super Mario 64. It just becomes a beautiful song, you know, a beautiful video game music standard. As these songs start to feel like, you know, communally owned material, the copyright restrictions don't necessarily go away. They're still there in the back somewhere. Like there's still somebody at Nintendo or somebody, whoever owns the rights to Dire Dire Docks, I don't know. Whoever owns those rights has every right to tell someone, you can't play this song anymore. This is my song. You, you can't do this. Stop doing this right now. You know, they have the right to do that. And frankly, that's a little scary, at least for me, for somebody who has been basing their livelihood off of arranging these songs. It is scary, and I don't really want to do that anymore. Now, for a long time, I kind of felt guilty that oh, I have uniquely, I am the only one that has stumbled into, you know, inadvertently profiting off of somebody else's content, and I am a bad person for doing that. But the more that I looked around, the more I realized that this particular group of issues regarding copyright wasn't just unique to me. It's a problem with the entire creator ecosystem. Maybe it's not a problem, but it's a phenomenon that's existed in the entire creator ecosystem. YouTube is full of people profiting off somebody else's creation. For example, there are reaction YouTubers who just record themselves watching somebody else's material. Even people like Let's Players and Twitch streamers are playing a game that was created and sold by somebody else, and if they do it professionally, are generating their own profit off of it. Now, I'm not saying this is inherently wrong. There are Let's Players and Twitch streamers out there that are innovative and add their own, you know, their own flavor to a game with their commentary, what they might what they might do with it. And I think that's wonderful. For me, it just solidifies the notion that ownership of intellectual property on the internet is just so complicated. There are people that make million dollar livings off of making reaction videos, or what are essentially reaction videos, not adding that much of their own, you know, and just reacting. And this is where it's up to interpretation, whether that reaction is enough to make something transformative. And I think there has been legal precedent that it is in some cases. I know there's an, there was an H3H3 lawsuit about it at some point, um, but I don't know too much about that. In, in my own case, all the time I spend transcribing, arranging, recording, and mixing these original arrangements that I write of video game music all goes, in my opinion, towards making a product that is extremely transformative because I'm not using any of the original audio or anything like that, just um, just the original, you know, the original song, the concept of the song, the composition. But in the end, it still originates from someone's copyrighted material, so I don't own it entirely myself. I don't have solutions to these problems of people making livings, profiting off of other people's, well, essentially profiting off of other people's creations. And I'm not sure it's a problem that needs to be solved. It could use some better addressing or a better system around it. Um, but all in all, the point I'm trying to make is that YouTube is a game. Social media is a game. And the goal of the game is to capture the attention of the viewer using whatever means possible and whatever means doesn't break TOS of the platform. You know, you can get right up there. You can get right up there to the edge of TOS and doing whatever, whatever means you choose to capture the attention of people and that's the game. You know, whoever gets the most attention wins. And as our attention spans change because of um, our inundation with digital media and platforms like TikTok that are just, you know, reducing our attention spans, not that that's necessarily an inherently bad thing, it becomes harder and harder. It becomes harder and harder to win that game. And when your competition is, you know, literally corporations on like, like, like Jimmy Fallon uploading clips on YouTube, who has, who is a celebrity who has, you know, millions and millions of dollars at their disposal and an entire team that's all centered around capturing the attention of people, it becomes nearly impossible to win, you know? And for me, I've decided the only way to win is to not play. And this is a game that I am not going to play. Lastly, at a personal level of why I'm choosing to stop making YouTube videos, 
Um, over these past 10 years of making YouTube videos, I've developed a lot as a musician, but also as a person. Um, when I started out, I was very self-conscious and, you know, scared of showing who I was to people because I felt like there was something wrong with me. There was something, something about me, how I was born, something about me that was different, something about me that was inherently wrong. And YouTube was my way of covering up that problem and fixing it. Um, with YouTube, I had finally found a way to construct an image of myself that other people would see that was only what I wanted them to see. You know, they didn't have to see the nervous kid inside, you know. They didn't have to see the nervous kid that got terrified of making a phone call or terrified of speaking up if they were ever to get, you know, scolded or terrified of getting anything less than an A in a class, you know. And this continued to continue as I grew up and went to college. Um, as long as I kept uploading videos and publishing stuff to the internet, I could get a constant stream of validation from people. This validation made up for the fact that I wasn't validating myself at all, that I didn't have the self-esteem and I felt like I needed to work so hard to show other people that there was something about me that was worth it. But in the end, it was just, you know, no matter how much would come in, it was a bathtub with a hole in the bottom. I couldn't be proud of myself. I couldn't feel like I was, you know, worth anything or a genuinely good person that has inherently good qualities. <laughs> so, I, And I've been unpacking all the stuff with a therapist over the past year. If you haven't ever seen a therapist, highly recommend it. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very good thing. Um, and I've just been, you know, digesting all this undigested emotion, going back into my past and trying to, you know, finally see all these things I was doing and these things I still continue to do for what they were and what they are and just digest it, live with it, feel it, let the emotions hit you and not try to brush them off and power through it as so many people, especially men of my generation, are encouraged to do. The more, and, and I'm not perfect at it, you know, I still do the, I, I still feel like I need to validate myself to other people. It still happens. But the more that I realize that I'm doing it, the better I get, the better I become at um, recognizing that I'm doing this just to get approval from somebody else. I can get this approval from myself by just acknowledging that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with myself. And that sometimes that's all it takes. That's all it takes. So as I learn to embrace myself more, to me, it feels appropriate to begin to tear down this wall that I've built for myself or tear down the suit of armor, the insane in the rain music suit of armor, essentially. Um, as the jazz, the video game jazz cover guy, you know, the video game jazz cover guy image that I've created for everybody else to see. I don't need that image out there to protect me anymore, or at least I don't want it to be there anymore because, you know, I can just show people that I'm me and that's enough. <laughs> so the past 10 years have brought so many good things, but, you know, I'm ready to stop putting myself in this artificial content creator box and instead expand my horizons and do what I really want to do. So what am I going to do now that I've explained all this stuff? Well, my main goal is to become more involved in the professional world of game audio, whether that's the capacity of a performer, composer, arranger, or otherwise. I'm all for it. I've had some of these opportunities come already, and the more I get them, the more I like doing it, because for me, it's a way to, you know, share my love of video games and music and contribute my own contribution to you know video game music as as a whole like in, in an official capacity um i've loved game music ever since i was a kid and creating these covers for the last 10 years has been my way to show my love for this music and to continue showing my love for the music i need to make some changes and for me i think that looks like doing it in a more official capacity not just doing fan arrangements or covers um i should note that I am certainly, certainly open to doing official arrangements. Like I know there's some, there's like a, there's a couple of piano collection albums, like the Celeste piano collections and stuff like that. Um, I would be down to do a uh, official jazz arrangement or official arrangement albums. Um, so <laughs> if you know anybody in the need for that, hit me up. <laughs> for me, this channel has always been about sharing my love for video game music. And just because I'm choosing to stop uploading 
doesn't mean I don't love video game music anymore. In fact, it's because I love game music so much that I'm choosing to stop uploading. In the immediate future, I'm going to be focused on composing music for upcoming projects, one of which is Attorney of the Arcane. I've made a video about this game already. It's the first game that I'm really getting a chance to, you know, score myself. And um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been so much fun to really be in the driver's seat and make this music. Um, there's no way I'd have enough time if I was still making YouTube videos to be able to put as much effort and detail into this music as I want to. Um, and I don't really want, so I don't really want to split my time that way. And uh, I'll be continuing to compose and do music, more work for games that I can't quite talk about publicly yet. If I can upload any of that work or any of my original stuff on the channel, I will. The uploads will not be consistent, but if I have something to share, if I have a project that I've completed or something I'd like to behind the scenes content maybe, I'd absolutely be willing to share that because I mean, as long as I have the complete rights and clearance to do so. <laughs> when I'm not working on game stuff, um, I've wanted to make an original album of music for some time. And this seems like just the right time to do that. You know, I've been so happy to see that many of you have been interested in my original music as well, even when it's not tied to any sort of game context. Song, some of my songs like Ford and Flow and Golden Battle, you know, people like that. And I like it too. And it's something that is entirely me. And I just want to keep sharing that with you guys. So I'm going, I'll probably be, I'll probably still do some of that, not on any sort of schedule but I will continue to do that probably. <laughs> now, I will acknowledge that this change for me is a big career shift and it's definitely going to um, impact my finances to some degree. Um, for the time being, I'm still going to be earning from mostly royalties accumulated from streaming my songs on Spotify, which have been licensed properly. Um, YouTube ad revenue, I'm not sure if I will still keep monetization on videos. Um, also with Patreon donations. I'm not sure the status of all that stuff currently. I'm going to be seeking some legal counsel on what I should do for that. But for the time being, as of this video, they'll still be on, but um, they may be turned off at some point as I shift. I would like to build up my own revenue stream as a freelance worker, doing stuff that is entirely owned by me, you know, stuff that is all me, not a cover of something else, not something else, not somebody else's copyrighted material, stuff that I make. Um, so if you have any gigs, <laughs> If you have gigs or leads or, you know, someone who might be able to help with that situation, I would love a recommendation. You can contact me via my uh, contact form on my website, which is linked in the description. I, I've never really, you know, made a public announcement or call that I'm available for this kind of work, but I could sure use your help. <laughs> As somebody who is effectively quitting their job, I could use your help quite a bit. <laughs> One last thing I'd like to share about my personal future. Um, the game music that has inspired me the most has always been Japanese video game music. Stuff like Pokemon, Xenoblade, Animal Crossing, all these games that came from Japan that have meant so much to me throughout my childhood and the beginnings of my adult life. Um, I just, there's something special about those games and that music. So I figure, why not try and get involved? Why don't, why don't I try and get involved in making music for Japanese games? Or not even being a composer, but, you know. If I could be the studio intern at the studio where they record the next Mario Kart soundtrack, I would just, like, I would explode. I would honestly explode. And that's something I like to do. Why not aim, you know, why not shoot for the stars and try to work with the people or the composers that have inspired me the most? And that's something I really want to do. Chinami ni Nihongo binko shiteimasu. を聞くと、いつも結構感動しています<笑><笑> <laughs> Man, that was kind of hard. So yeah, I've been I've been studying my Japanese, and uh, if all goes well, and depending on the situation of Corona, I might be studying Japanese at a language school in Tokyo um, for a certain period of time. I don't know how long yet, but 
That's something I would like to do. Yeah, that's been a new development. <laughs> Before I finish, what's going to happen with this channel specifically? So it's going to continue to be the home base for me and any of my um, composing and original stuff. I'm not going to maintain any sort of upload schedule or promise any consistency. Um, anything that I post from this point forward will be original music or music that I have the complete authorization to distribute. Um, I will also no longer be selling any new physical merchandise with copyrighted material that I don't have the complete legal right to do so, um, including but not limited to my CDs and vinyls. I'll no longer be distributing those. If you have any questions about this transition or any questions about any of the stuff that I've said so far, you're welcome to leave a comment below. I can't promise a response, but I'll try and read all of them. Before I finish off, I'd like to address uh, my content creator friends here. Um, if you're still watching, <laughs> I am so grateful to have met you. You all have changed my life in so many ways. Every one of you is tremendously, tremendously skilled, even more than you probably know. And maybe you're satisfied with your life of creating content and you've managed to maintain a good balance, in which case I applaud you. You've done way better than I have. <laughs> you're still going and you haven't chosen to stop, you know, stop being content creator or stop uploading to your YouTube channel. That's, that's great. However, there may be some of you out there who, you know, feel trapped in this content creation business trapped by your audience, trapped by expectations of what you should and shouldn't do, um, trapped by like thinking of what the best thing to drive engagement is, making the most money or paying your bills. And if you do feel trapped, just remember that sometimes the strongest traps are the ones that we put ourselves in. That was certainly the case for me. Life is way too short to live based on what other people think of you. It's so short. In the grand scheme of things, we don't have very much time. And we should use that time, you know, creating memories and doing things that are true to ourselves. So whatever that means to you, and as much as you can, I encourage you to live your life in your own way, in a way that is true to yourself. In fact, if you take one thing away from this video, remember that your life is short, that someday we're all probably going to die. So you might as well live your life on your own terms. So everybody, thank you so much for everything over these years. Thank you for listening to my music, going to shows, supporting me, leaving comments, all of it. I am so grateful for it. I am hopeful that these next 10 years surpass anything that I could even imagine now. And I'm going to do my absolute best and work my absolute hardest to make sure that that becomes reality. This has been Insane in the Rain Music, and I will see you again soon.